It, yes, exactly. <laughs> okay. But his wife, it, oh, <laughs> his lady was there, you know, he might have been laying it on a bit thick, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 think, I think he was definitely laying on thick then. I, I, I definitely think he was. <laughs> right. So uh, uh, he, he likes a bit, bit of bravado, our uh, Roger. Anyway, it's it's on record, and um, I've just I've just got to do a, a quick security thing, and then we'll get started. And it's good to see you. It's good to see you, Anne. You've uh, you've you've joined you've joined us at an appropriate time. Oh gosh, hello. Which which <laughs> which makes a change? Well, we are. Hello, Bill. Hello, all. Oh, we shut. Oh. Okay. Good. 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 We're missing, missing our meetings. Indeed, indeed, we are. What, what with, what, what with Del, Del butting in all the time and sort of, uh, and, and and coming up with silly, silly sort of thoughts and ideas. Oh, Bill, Bill misses it. Yeah, Bill misses it. I do. It's not the same. This isn't the same. No. Oh, I, I know. Uh, it's but it's right. nice to see. It's nice to see um, other people. You yeah, know, of course yeah. it is. Yeah, yeah. Because um, our class nothing. Mm -hmm. wasn't very big, was it? Our, our class. And um, Carl, you're just looking so scruffy. You know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hang on a minute. Hang, hang, go on, Anne. Just, just say it. I don't know. <laughs> I've given you a word, huh? <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> Give you a word. Okay, I've got a bit of a shock for you. Okay, oh, after I've done this pirate stuff, which will be the end of um, October, I I've got to do an audition, and you're never going to believe this. I, 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 I may as well just make this up, right? To play the role of a very famous figure in history. Well, yeah. I keep, I keep thinking. Stephen Jesus Christ. <laughs> oh my goodness me! I, I got to play the role of Jesus Christ. Really? Appar oh. appar 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 apparently, right, um, having a beard and being of white skin is definitely what Jesus Christ looked like. Probably. Uh, and on that note, we're going to, we, we are going <laughs> to, so, so basically I, I wanted this week to, to go back to the beginning. So um, when, when we, when we, one of, one of the great things uh, that, w that we can say in history is when when we sort of follow the concept of the line as uh, Tim Ingold, Professor Tim Ingold, um, as enshrined and as bestowed upon all of us, uh, which we've done been doing a really good we've been doing a really good route uh, when when we, when we've been sort of following this line. Um, I, I think what we need to do is people that really saw that the line was important is actually the Romans. And I and I thought I thought this would be great. Bill loves the Romans. Uh, Richard loves the Romans. He, Richard even had a Roman lecture yesterday um, in, in Barry because we still got we still got our live class that we do in Barry. Um, and it's it's quite uh, Bill. If you think this this little group is odd, um, my group in Barry uh, uh, is is very strange, isn't it, Richard? Oh, Richard's not even, there, Bill. Richard's not even commenting. So, He's turned on. I know, we're all pretty strange. Yeah, exactly. So, so, so what I want us to do, right, is to look directly straight into this. I want, I want us to think of the line and I want us to think of Roman Britain, right? Um, and an age-old thing that keeps coming up in my lectures, uh, the road, right, and the concept of the road. But... Um, what 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 we need to do, right? Hang on a minute. Oh, what we need to do um, is try and figure out where where my uh, where my gubbins are. Hang on a minute. So we don't want that. We want. Uh, hang on. Oh, hang on. Let, well, what do we need? Right, we need that. Good. That's what I wanted. Good. A good old map of Roman London. Love it. Excellent. And actually, this is quite a nice one, isn't it? So. The, the one the one thing when when we think and we follow the line we think of the concept is that the Romans overdid it big time in Britain right the idea 
the, the sense of, of roads, the, 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 the sense of buildings, grandeur, the sense of something that people were not really not used to, right? Building materials, uh, aqueducts, um, adopting former roads with putting gravel or whatever on them, um, basilicas, forums, military, sense, order, money, trade, all these things. But without getting too exciting, um, when, when we do think about Roman Britain, uh, we're not just talking about um, the line as being the road. And this is this is a concept that, that I've been trying to get people away from. And, and what I mean by that, I've, I've got to I've got to justify that statement. I've got to really explain what what, what that statement means. Uh, one one thing that we said yesterday in my Roman discussion in Barry was this idea that is really starting to come out there that if you want to find a Roman road, you've got to find a road that existed before the Roman road. And in fact, the road that you're looking for was adopted by the Romans and that routeway has been there for thousands of years. And inevitably, people think of the idea of the Roman road being straight. Um, and they always think, well, they're straight because they're going from A to B. Well, um, they're not really going from A to B at all. The A to B was already there. That location, um, people had a pathway and it just went, happened to be straight, right? But as we do know, the idea of the line can be curved, can be straight, can be through layers, um, can be a layer, can be anything. And this is everything that we've been thinking of and doing. And one, one, of, one of the key parameters that I think about used to and maybe do, still do and maybe don't is when we look at the idea of a Roman town or city, it always seems to be arranged with the sense of the line, the, the, the sense of the avenue, the, the sense of the perspective, um, order, order. Um, and this is one thing that we need to bring out today the sense of order where where it it's almost as if the past brugal harvester there's there's order in everything there's a sense of connectedness there's a sense of place there's a sense of belonging and there's a sense of great understanding about our past when we think about this order whether it's a straight line, whether it's a curve, whether it's a river, whether it's X, Y, and Z, the idea of order is very important, not just throughout history, but throughout the Roman ideal. Some of you have no doubt been with me when we stood on the top of a hill and I've said, there's a Roman gate there. And people say, yeah, but it just suddenly drops away and it goes down a great escarpment. But they put a gate there because they, there was always meant to be a gate facing northwards, as there was meant to be a gate facing southwards, as there was meant to be a gate facing eastwards and westwards. It just happened to be that there was an escarpment there and you can't take a cart down an escarpment. But they needed to jolly well put a gate there. That's a sense of order. It doesn't necessarily mean that the, the York the landscape needs to be a playing card set shape. But in many ways, the idea of Rome is always set and shaped and ordered in one way or another. We look at this little map. This this is, an, do you know what? When you look at maps of uh, Roman London, right? They're, they're always a lot more complicated than this. And you can't see bugger all because it's always organized. It, it, it's sort of too organized. You can't really work out what's going on. But what you can work out what's going on is there's a fort over there. There's a forum there. There happens to be things that are familiar, like the Temple of Mithras, the amphitheater that we really started to excavate in the 1980s in London. Various gates, old, Alders Gate, moving all the way. Over. Oh, hang on a minute. We, we've moved a little bit too far there. Over there. City wall, there it is. 
one bit of that, more or less a little bit further south of that word in City Wall, is where the modern day Tower of London is. That happens to be smack bang placed in where this wall is. Mm. But one thing that we need to say is the higgledy piggledy nature of order. Now, I, I think this is a theme that we also need to keep stretching over next week and the week after that. Um, because I, I have I have enshrined in us to see the past as 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 a direct route, um, as a progression, as everything's connected in with one and another, and another and within one itself. And when we think of this map, we think of Southgate, and we think about the bridges, and we think about Carl. Are you losing the plot? Where's the order here? There is order. It just happens to be organized in a certain way. Now, somebody, um, those of you who know me know that I've got OCD and, and people with OCD need to have things ordered. Uh, well, I haven't got ordered OCD. My, my, my life is so disorganized that there's order and the disorganization. And this is where I am when we think of the Roman world the disorganization of order. And again, that concept of a line not necessarily being straight. There's order in that. Now, what I would like to do today is I would like to look at a few other Roman towns and, and look at little maps, yeah? And then next week, what we're gonna do, we'll, we'll take that a little bit further. So what, I, what I'm really trying to do and achieve is that, the past couple of weeks, we've been looking at the, the sense of the sea, the sense of movement, the sense of change and putting some order within it. To, to be honest with you, I'm going to say it, uh, that there's sort of a little adage that King Canute um, tried, tried to control the sea. Why right? he, he ordered the sea to, to stop and it didn't stop. Well, actually, he, it did stop, right? But not at the time that he wanted it to. In fact, King Canute was was correct in what he was trying to do. If he if he if he would have if he would have put his seat there when he knew the sea was going out, he could have ordered the sea not to come in. That's a sense of order. It's a sense of magic as well. It's a sense of place within the narrative of the past. The past is always a narrative. The past is a stage where there's performances on that stage. One thing that we need to grasp is that within this order, there's disorder. And what we mean by that is when we want to see the past, we need to be very specific on what time of the past we're seeing. Yeah. And what do I mean by that? Earlier on, I thought of the old Sammy Wanamaker that was involved with the Globe and Rose Theatre projects. And people said that obviously when they were excavating the Globe and the Rose Theatre and, and the Swans being excavated now, right? Um, people argued with um, Sam Wanamaker and said, right, it, it must have been the Globe that William Shakespeare performed at, or it must have been the Rose Theatre that William Shakespeare performed at. Sam Wanamaker was not really concerned who performed at those theatres. People perform, performed at those theatres. Queen Elizabeth may have been at all of them or none of them. William Shakespeare may have been at all of those theatres in the 1500s or none of them. But the fact of the matter is they represented a moment in the past that today we take it for granted. But what Sam Wanamaker wanted to do was to make us feel connected to the past. That's what he was trying to do. He wanted us to feel that the past was relevant and important. And when he saved the Rose Theatre, all for the good. And I just thought earlier on, I don't give a fag whether, theatrical term there, I don't give a fag whether the Rose Theatre was a place where the wonderful William Shakespeare performed. And you could argue that William Shakespeare was, was somebody completely different. I'm not really interested in that detail. What I'm interested in is, is the moment in the past and those layers and the intricacies of that past that makes the past such a star of interest. So connected to us today that 
it's almost as if it's with us all the time. And the past is with us all the time. We digress, but we didn't digress at all because we're talking about London. We're talking about the south side, Southwark. Southwark, there it is, where lots of those theatres are to be found. But that is a thousand plus years after Roman London ceased to be Roman London. But there's also, there's also the layers of names and interpretation in what those names and understandings and terminologies mean. And one thing that I've really been getting into on Tuesday, and I've been, which I will get onto tonight, and what I was talking about yesterday was this with this idea of names and interpretation. Yesterday, all those that came along, and there were six of us yesterday morning, um, in my studio, we start uh, in, in my studio and our, our studio. Um, we, we started painting it yesterday and it's starting to sort of look a little bit better, right? And um, one of the things I was saying that when we think about the Roman world in Britain, was it truly the Roman world in Britain? Or was it just an extension of the Iron Age that in fact was born back into a new age, the Roman age? One of the places I would like to show you is Caliva Atrobatum, which is Silchester. But I haven't done everything in regards to this site, right? And so today what I'm gonna what I'm gonna do, I'm very aware of time and I don't want to run over too much into seven o'clock and whatever. Yeah. So what what we are going to do, I'm just going to write down one location and I'm going to write down Caliva Atrobatum because I might forget, you never know. So when when we think when we think about this sense of order, yeah. right? We 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 think about Roman London and you think right there's a fort there, right? There's a fort, and that looks fairly organised, right? <laughs> the amphitheatre. Why the hell is the amphitheatre there? Why isn't it further out? But there's an amphitheatre there. Order. There's a fort associated with the city. That's order. Usually there was a fort associated with most Roman cities in Britain and around the world, or it was at least a garrison. The Forum, that's order. The Forum is set on, yeah, okay, on, on an idea of Rome, right? Um, and whoever's got their mic on and I can hear stuff, can you close your mic now? Because I want to keep flowing. Good. Um, so order, fort, amphitheater, forum, forum, temples, pal governor's palace. Well, not all, there's only, there's probably only two two governor's palaces that we know about in Britain, right? One maybe at Woodchester or maybe Fishbourne and the, this governor's palace um, in, for example, London. But, you know, the order comes with having a forum and a basilica. Now, this is when things don't go to plan in Roman London. <clears throat> Here we go. What doesn't go to plan in Roman London? It's not very well organized, is it? It is organized. But the disorganization within the order is that all those squares there are not occupied with houses. It's not really well developed. So the order is saying, this is where people are going to be. The River Walbrook, yeah, we'll have that flowing there. We'll sort of put a, put a bit of culvert there, blah, blah, blah. We'll put bridges in. We'll put roads in. That's order. The disorder is, is the fact that not all of Roman London was occupied, right? Disorder, right? Disorder within the order. Right. There's also something here. When, when we think about this basilica um, and we think about the forum, there's, there's, there's a very interesting fact that, that I can give you uh, about this locality. Hang on a minute. I just got a, I just got a bit of a problem here in a minute. I'm just going to go. Right. OK, that's fine. Um, there's something there's something really strange happens in London. Right. Lots of weird things always happen in London, even to today. That, that that's part of the order. Strange, but order. Um, so when when we think about the word this basilica and the forum, right? When the Romans realized about 300 years AD, right, that Roman was Roman London, Londinium was not really going to develop like like um, uh, like Nîmes in France. It wasn't going to develop um, 
for example, like Greece, uh, like like Athens, it wasn't going to develop like Constantinople, it wasn't going to develop like Rome. I got all the cities in my head suddenly. Um, the the Roman the Roman governor decided that half of the basilica and the forum was going to be demolished. Now, that is very odd, because that is very odd, but it's not very odd at all. When they realised that the, the Basilica and Forum was too big for the city, um, it, it, people started to say, hang on a minute, you've got, this, you've got this huge Basilica, you've got this huge Forum, right? It's hardly being used. It's bloody difficult to maintain, right? We're going to have to pull some of it down. So when people are, when pe archaeologists are excavating, right, they always think the Basilica and the Forum is going to be one of the last buildings that identifies Roman Britain within Roman London, which has been abandoned. But the fact of the matter is, it's it's all it's partly half of it's already a third, and I probably a half then is already been abandoned by about four hundred years AD. So the fact of the matter is, does that come in order or disorder? Well. It comes in disorder. The idea of, of demolishing part of the Basilica and Forum is something that we don't really understand, and something that we do understand because maybe it's too big. Having that sort of status of Roman civilization in Rome being partly pulled down is, is something that we really don't understand. So you've got a bit <clears throat> of disorder there, right? Um, so this is one thing that the archaeologists find. What we also find is if we move to something else, if you understand that concept I just looked at there, if we if we look at the Temple of Mithras, now the Temple of Mithras is an amazing structure. Um, it was excavated in the 1950s, 1956, and it was moved. It was moved just down the road. And um, because the landscape was being developed, right? Temple of Mithras. So if we, if we, um, uh, we, we, we don't need to look at a Temple of Mithras today, but but you can quickly look it up on the, on the internet. Temple of Mithras, London, right? So it it was moved. It was moved to another street, right? And um, and then when they put the Bloomsburg building up, um, in the past um, uh, five or so years, they decided to move the the Temple of Mithras from where it had been placed to the original location where it was initially, and it's now underneath the Bloomsburg building, um, and you can go and see the Temple of Mithras. Now, what is interesting about the Temple of Mithras is it's massively it's massively ordered, right? There's no real sense of disorder. And what, what we do think with the Temple of Mithras is it was constructed. It comes in within having a temple in Roman Londinium, right, which is great. It's very likely towards the end of the Temple of Mithras's use, it was actually converted into <clears throat> a, Christian a Christian shrine, a change of use, which is very typical for... Roman buildings, right? So back to that point I just made about this. They demolished part of the Basilica and the Forum. They didn't use it for something else, which would be a typical thing for the Romans to do, but they demolished big chunks of it, which is not what we usually see in other locations, right? So when we when we see about the Temple of Mithras, we think about the Temple of Mithras, it, it's initially a, um, um, a temple associated um, with, with the religion of Mithras, which comes from the East, and then uh, the new religion that comes from the East is also the religion of Christianity. So it continues in use. So you've got a sense of order within the landscape of Roman London. Also sense of order as well. You've got the baths. Um, you've got the um, gate, gate out, the, the gateways, the gateways, the wall around the outside. Uh, not necessarily straight, but it's, it's still a Roman wall. So a sense of order. Cemetery. This is a big thing. Now, you will now understand what I mean by order and disorder, right? Uh, cemeteries outside a Roman city, a Roman sound, that's where they went. It, it doesn't matter whether there's 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 a hundred graves there, but they've got to be outside of a city, right? They can be higgledy piggledy, they can be spread out over a field, they can be alongside the road, right? It's order. It's order within the sense of the Roman world because a cemetery had to be outside a Roman city, Roman town. It had to be outside there. Uh, because it, it was it was sort of the Roman ideal um, that you couldn't have houses, you couldn't have living in amongst the dead, right? So if we go if we go to somewhere like Southwark, what we do find with Southwark, right? There are examples in the north, but Southwark's a bit easier. 
what we find in Southwark is that there's lots of burials in Southwark, right? And um, there's a vicus, there, there's an extension of the Roman city uh, of Londinium um, towards the north of the Thames. There it is, fair enough, we don't need to say it more. But where the where, there's disorder in Southwark, because what happens in Southwark, they, they've laid it all out, and then suddenly Southwark needs to expand. So where there was burials outside the bounds of Southwark, uh, they decided to build on the burial site, which is abhorrent in the Roman world, but that's what they did. They expanded the city south. Hang on a minute. Didn't I say there weren't enough people living in Londinium within the ward landscape? Yeah, I'm right. I'm correct with that. But people like to live south of the bank, Southwark. And they decided instead of living in the city, right, uh, which was probably, you know, um, owned by um, aristocrats and they, they were going to charge you a great deal to actually live there. We do actually have land deeds. Amazingly enough, that this is this is one thing. When we've been excavating in London, we've actually got we've actually got um, documents now. Um, um, I, I'm not exactly sure they're uh, papyri documents. I think actually I think they're papyri documents. I can't really quote me on that. But what we've got, we've got written documents about land deeds and stuff. Right. And, and we, we got an idea what was going on. So what we've got with Southwark, it's disor it, it's within the order that this <laughs> organization because people start to um, build within the landscape of the dead, which is disorganization, which is disordered, ordered, disordered. There we go. So what I'm, I'm hopefully you're getting an idea what, what I'm exactly talking about now. So what I'd like to do now, uh, this is this is one that I wasn't going to do today, but we're going to do it. We're going to look at Caliva. Acrobatum. A um, year ago, um, Caliva. Oh, hang on, not Faliva. Um, and I've just, I just remembered. Uh, Roger's not joining us today, is he? He said he's away. Oh, so we can run over a little bit. Anyway, um, look at this one. This is exact. This is the plan of Silchester, which is um, southwest of Reading. Uh, this is um, this is this is Caliva Atrobatum, um, and Caliva Atrobatum has been ex extensively excavated for the past hundred and twenty odd years, probably more. Right, um, and one thing that we can clearly see, right, what you can you can argue with me on this one. You can see that's very organized, but it's in your idea of organization, but it's also in the Roman idea of organization. Can you see what I'm trying to get at now, right? Uh, this is copybook sort of Roman city, right? This is a lot more organized than London, but London was organized and it was ordered, right? Keep that in your mind. So so you, you've got everything organized here, yeah? And what you've got, you've got this typical um, insular, street plan these are known as little insula insulae uh, these little boxes in here along a grid pattern right typical um very 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 typical you've got your north gate you've got your south gate you've got your east gate you've got your west gate right you've got your amphitheater you've got your roads you've got your forum um it's showing it in it's got a round temple it's showing the amphitheater all these are a sense of order right so what i would like to do now is actually get this one, right? Um, do you know what? One of one of the things one of the things I absolutely love is looking at things like this. I, I, I've got I love reconstructions. I, I love I love the way things things are reconstructed, right? How much of this is how much of this um, you can say? Oh, you know that's that's the way it will be, and that's the way it should be, right? Is the reconstruction right or wrong? Depending on which time of the time time of the Roman world you're talking about, but but for the sake for the sake of this argument today, for the sake of where we are today, um, what what we do find is, is that you can see the wonderful streets, the avenues, the the sense of the vista, the, the sense of the forum in the middle. But when you actually start looking at it, it's not. It doesn't actually look ordered, but it is all ordered. People are living within these insula, but you can actually make out that it's not always on the left there. It's not fully occupied. Disorder up in up in the right hand side there, a disorder again. So what we are talking about 
in a way uh, th these other little plots. So the the obsession, like the, this is, I'm talking about order and disorder. Uh, the 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 whole the whole thing the whole thing with um, ancient Rome was that if you're going to build a city, people have got to live there. That's the reason. That's the reason. Love me for the reason. Let the reason be love. And the love is Rome itself, right? The sense of Rome, the gravity, the gravitas of gravitating to the city, gravitating to the sense of order, gravitating to Tim. Tim Ingold would have a field day with this. He, he, um, you can imagine um, him using this as as the sense of line, the sense of order. It's all there. You know, you've got trees, you've got people, you've got buildings, you've got walls, you've got ditches, amphitheatres, bathhouses. All of these things are going on. People are wandering down the street. People are even doing a little bit of farming inside the town and city. Right. So for a time, um, you, you could you could gravitate the sense of a sense of organisation, a sense of order. The idea of Rome is organised, ordered. But what what we've got to do now is slowly start to think about Rome as not being on par in Britain as the Rome that we actually see on the continent. So what, what we mean by that, say for example, right, you go you go to um, you go to Rome, right, the eternal city of Rome. And one of the things that you actually see about the eternal city of Rome um, is that people are packed in like sardines. That's ordered. That's organized, right? Uh, a million people uh, lived in Rome at the height of its popularity, sometime around 310, 320, and then one million people lived in Rome, packed within those streets, packed within the seven hills of Rome itself, packed within those walls, one million people, right? How is that, or how is that ordered? Of course it's ordered. You, you can work out that you've got a million people. They, they, need, uh, they need X amount of loaves of bread. Uh, you can have X amount of water going into London, uh, Rome. You can start again. You have X amount of water going into Rome. You can control Rome. You can, you can control its bread. You can control its wine. You can control the taxes. You can control the money. You can control the games. You can control the bars. Everything is controlled. Everything is ordered and organized. Right. And one of the one of the biggest problems, if you want to have a comparison with somebody somewhere like Khalifa Atrabatum Silchester, there's another there's no other point to be made about Khalifa Atrabatum and Silchester, but I won't say it yet. Right. Um, and the word happening to remind me needs to be put there uh, is that there ain't the large, large flats. There's, there's no there's no t basically in London. You, you had uh, tenement blocks. Right. You had. Um, three, four, five, six story uh, flats in London, in, 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 in Rome, right? That's where you had them in, in Rome. You had five, six story flats in Rome, right? Here you didn't. In Caliver Atabatum, London, you didn't. You didn't have that going on, right? Um, also, um, you didn't have all these little squares occupied. If this had been Rome, by the age the city got to 350, 400, right? Um, there would be thousands and thousands of houses radiating mm -hmm. outside, right? The burial ground would be gone. Obviously, disorder, mm -hmm. but the burial ground would be gone, right? Um, this would be so crammed and packed um, that by the time you get the collapse of Roman civilization in Britain, this city would be still fully operational, but it's not. One of the things that we do know, and, and I, 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 I've, I've moved a little bit further than I wanted to, to but I'm going to say this because I'm going to go before, right? We're going to go before, we're going to go after, right? One thing that we do know about Caliva at the bottom is that by the time you get about 500 years AD, Caliva at the bottom is more or less totally abandoned, right? Um, and lots of Archaeologists have postulated why Caliva Atrobatum is abandoned. I've got a book here that I that I I've got to review called The Fall of Roman Britain for a Lessig Pillar. And by the way, a Lessig Pillar, the next uh, next edition should be with you very very shortly. And the Fall of Roman Britain. This guy argues 
Um, lots of different points. Um, he basically argues about the, the fall of the use of Latin and was Roman Britain actually truly Roman, right? The answer's no. And he's right. The answer is no. I've been saying that for a very long time. Roman Britain was not truly Roman at all. So um, one, one, of, one of the great things is, is that 90% of all the cities that has existed in Roman Britain, for example, 90% of all the cities were abandoned by around 500 years AD. Even the big cities like, like um, Carlisle and Viraconian, Roxeter, were being abandoned. Londinium was more or less completely abandoned. Eberarkham, York may have continued, right? Uh, Winchester sort of continued. Caliver Atrobatum, no. Glevum, Gloucester, no. Colchester, Camel and Junum, yes, a little bit, right? But most of these cities collapsed because they never had the sense of order and organization as the cities that we see dotted around the Roman Empire south of the English Channel. One of the things I, I, I do actually want to go on to looking a little bit at Kalian, actually. Um, but we will do that in a moment. There's that other point I wanted to make about Caliva Atrobatum. And this is going to be quite a complicated concept and not one that I'm going to be able to explain lightly. I've talked about the end of Caliva Atrobatum. I've talked about the sense of order and disorder. I've talked about it after it was once a Roman city of a big big Roman place however this is this is a very difficult concept and I said it yesterday and I've said it a few times in the past Caliva Atrobatum would have been a city with or without the Romans coming over to Britain but it would have been a different city it would have been a city organized on our order our sense of order order what would this city have looked like if Roman Britain had never happened or the Roman era had never happened, right? I'm going to be very careful with the wording that I've just used because well before the Roman invasion, so-called, of AD 43, there were lots of links with Rome already. Cantii, Canterbury, had, had substantial traders and people thinking about building in the Roman fashion, Caliva Atrobatum, there were roads already leading to it. And there was a sense of maybe some arrangements of streets in Caliva Atrobatum before the Romans ever got to Britain in AD 43. So if we scrub the idea of a Roman invasion and it never happened, it could never have, it may never have happened. But if it never happened, wh what would this city have looked like? Well, it certainly wouldn't have had the forum in it. It wouldn't have had bathhouses. It wouldn't have had an amphitheater. It may have had a ditch around the outside, but it wouldn't have had a stone wall around it. Most of the buildings would have been timber. But I'm sure they would have been enticed to have some kind of water system leading into the the city if it hadn't have been constructed after AD 43 as a count of the Roman invasion. The idea that the way people would have been built a city would have been very different but they would have had their religious places they would have had their religious temples and things would have happened but it would have been a different sense of order. The line may not have been as straight, but the line would be a line nevertheless. The sense of ideals would have been enshrined with our own ideals, with a little bit of influence from Rome. You never know. If there was no AD 43, somebody may have actually built a structure that looked like a Roman palace, smack bang in the middle of Carilla Veratrovatum, 
But again, there would never have been that forum there. Maybe what they would have done is they would, may have had more waterways leading to the city, or they may, may have just carried on with their trackways. However, we do believe that 200 years after AD 43, if no Roman invasion, there may have been a city that would have equaled some of the cities in at least northern France, if not lots of the ones that were being developed by the Romans actually in Germania. But it would have been a very different urban sprawl. You never know, they may have decided to put a little bit of a forum in there that people could actually meet or something. But we would have developed on another, another direction. But you know what? And th this, is, this, is a very, this is a very difficult concept to get. If there was no Roman invasion, we would have become civilized anyway. Because what would have happened? Um, there would have been those Angles and Saxons and Jutes coming over. There would have been people from Germany coming over. There'd be maybe one or two Roman settlers coming over. There would have been, there would have been another sense of Christianity. It would have been a very, very different Christianity. A bit like that Christianity that, that was around, still around Scotland in the 1700s. Sort of very, very sort of God fearing. But we would have developed, we, there would have been Viking invasions, right? There, or were there Viking invasions? Be very careful of that. There, there would have been Viking in, incursions, I would say, rather than a Viking invasion. Think, things would have happened, right? Um, there wouldn't have been an Eberarkum or a York, but guess what? There would have been a Dublin. Dublin would have existed in Ireland. The Romans really didn't have much hand in the development of Dublin. In fact, there was no Roman hand in the development of Dublin. Dun, bogs, brackish landscape, where Dublin was developed in, in Ireland. And the, if, we, if we want to take Ireland away from the sense of the British perspective, Ireland developed. I, Ireland developed by itself, some people say. May have been a little bit of Roman influence earlier on. However, by the time the, the Vikings start getting over to Ireland, a Dublin, that's where we get the, the name Dublin from, in the 800s, right? There'd be no such thing as Rome anymore anyway, right? Or if, if and we're talking about a time if there was no Roman invasion of mainland Britain anyway. So, so all of these things would have happened. We didn't necessarily, necessarily need Rome to do it, right? And one of the, one of the things that, that, that we, we, we look at is, is constantly being reminded yesterday of of this uh, thing, oh, Roman Britain. After Roman civilization collapsed in Britain, what happened to the, what happened to Latin? And we're thinking, well, we know exactly what happened to Latin. Most people weren't even speaking it. 99% of the whole population of Britain was actually of native breed, or people had come over from the continent from different parts. Even we get evidence of Chinese, Chinese settlers in Britain, right? But the proportion of, of, of yes, yes, we've got archaeological evidence for that, so don't knock it. Um, what maybe one percent of the population was of Roman blood, the rest of it wasn't. So, so you think, well, if they're trying to push Latin to the noble people, um, and maybe most of the the, the 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 writers, most of the librarians, most of the um, the religious men spoke Latin, but there wouldn't be many of them. Right, and the and the really um, the um, the religious bent that Latin had would have continued on, but most of the average people just wouldn't have understood it anyway. You know, I, I don't know if, if um, Anne's got this um, got this thing. Um, maybe when Anne went to uh, the Catholic schools that she went to, um, were they still preaching to you in Latin? Um, I, I they may have right, um, and you can come back to me when we, when we do the questions right. But most people um, never ever spoke Latin anyway. Um, so you could you could think about this whole sort of thing as being sort of a little bit. The Roman era was was more of an event in the eyes of historians rather than the reality that was actually on the ground. 
So what I, what I want to do now is I want us to, to bend this lecture and I want us to go over to something a lot more familiar. I want us to look at the uh, Roman, Roman military site of Isca and then a site that become very, very different. So if we type this in now, and we go there, and we type on, it's quite easy, this one. I wonder if we'll get the Roman, I uh, wonder if we'll get the Alan Sorrell 1950s, 60s uh, image, but Roman Caerleon, there we go, lots of it. I was mainly going to focus on the, I was mainly going to focus on sort of Londinium today, but didn't really need to. Um, I think that's based on Aaron Sorrell's work there on the right. And what I need is a bit more of an overview. We've got some of them, but they're not really what I want. Yeah, let's start with that, right? This is very familiar when most people go to, most people go to Killian. They... Killian as a Roman military base is is very much the epitome of Roman order and organization. But then again, if you want to if you want to if you want to pick it, those squares are not all the same size and the same dimensions, right? But it has the functions of Roman order, south, east, um, south, north, east, west gates. It's got a military HQ in the middle. It's got workshops, granaries, barracks, hospital, um, Roman baths inside and outside, and the amphitheatre. However, that comes into another story. Now, when when we when we look at this, it looks all really nice. And when you go to Kalian. You're almost hoodwinked to believe that Killian looks like this today, but it doesn't. There was only a there was only a short period of time that Killian ever looked like this, right? Take away the amphitheater out of your ideas, right? There was only a short period of time that the Killian looked this ordered. It was like this from roughly sometime um, in the mid 70s AD. And it was like this roughly to about 115, 120 odd AD. And then the order become disorganized and ordered in a different way. Mm. Right. So what if we if we want to sort of look back again? Um, and what we need to do. Loads of lovely illustrations. I think this probably this is one that we'll be very familiar with. Right, this. Now, this is this is the sense of ordered reconstructions. Right. And I gotta be honest with you, by the time that huge um uh, Ro Roger's actually gonna Roger Roger's coming on tonight. So guys, we've got to make sure that we that we uh um that, that we're well behaved, right? So this this military site here, um, by the time all this stuff on the left was constructed, the military site was now being occupied by civilians. Um, and at this stage, this amphitheater was obviously well in use and being used for a variety of purposes that weren't military, but because by about 120, more or less the entire of the military garrison moved out. So what happened was was an ordered military base, which was surrounded by storage depots and all the rest of it, which could be sense, seen in the sense of order. Um, and and what's happening is Killian itself is given away to the civilian world, right? Which is a new order in itself, a new sense of perspective, a new sense of the line, a, a new sense of the Roman era. So what we're going to do there, um, we're actually going to stop and find out if anyone's got any questions. All right. So um, what we're going to do is I need to get back to you guys. Um, and what we're going to do. Um, there we go. And what, what and let's just see if anyone's got any questions. So 
So what we'll do, we'll uh, we'll introduce the the next session um, after we've done these questions, and um, and we'll just we'll just carry on through. Right, Stephen, anything you'd like to say? Um, it, I, I suppose it's interesting to talk around about the kind of the, the order disorder. I think from from what you've been talking about, would would a Roman if they were if they came across to um, London at the time? Would they have recognised the components and the characteristics? I mean, obviously, it's not it's not necessarily the same, but presumably, in terms of some of the the buildings and some some certainly some of the structures and some of the engineering requirements, they, they would have recognised the. Uh, yeah, this this is a thing. It, it's an enshrinement of the Roman idea and the Roman belief to see that's the order in the Roman eyes. When we look at it, when we look at it from a perspective today, we think everything should be ordered in in. But to them, th their their sense of order was very very different. Um, order and disorder. You know what I'm saying? You you can basically I know where everything is around me, but it, it's it's completely disorganised. But I know where my uh, where that is, and I know where my book is there, and I know where this is, and I know I can find things in disorder, right? Yeah. But it's not the same sense of order that Bill would have. If you go to Bill's house, it's pristine. I, I, I've, I've been around Bill's house on Zoom. He, he, he moves the camera around and it looks perfect. But Bill knows where everything is as well. That's his sense of order. Yeah, I and that's, You know? So, okay. Okay, thank you for that, Steve. Um, right, and uh, Bill. Yeah, I noted the, um, the reconstruction images of uh, Londinium and Caliva Atrobatum. The perimeter wall was in the shape of an irregular polygon. Yes. And we know, or we led mm -hmm. to believe, that all perimeter walls on forts and towns are in the shape of a regular oblong. So are we saying that uh, we found in Londinium that that's not the case? They just, forget, they just followed the terrain to actually construct the perimeter wall to suit themselves. To suit what uh, was exactly. That's what, that's what they did in Eberarkum. This is what they did with most Roman cities in Britain, in fact. Um, we're talking about myths. We're talking about the Roman road myth. Uh, we're, we're talking about, right, what, what I was getting at, and which you already know what I was getting at, the, the idea, we've got to have roads in the Roman world. So what we'll do, there's a road there, we'll just adopt it. It's Roman, right? Uh, we've got to put a wall up, but we don't necessarily need a wall. We'll put a gateway there, but we don't necessarily need a gateway, but that's what we're meant to put there. Whether the gateway goes there or there, the, the gateway is meant to be there, right? So this, this is, this is, and back to what Stephen said, um, the idea was, of Rome was to actually see um, where, where everything is and you, you feel you're at home. And Roger and um, Henry, thanks for joining us. We're, um, uh, we're, we're just doing the questions for the, for the class now. So uh, welcome on board. So um, no, Bill, um, it's it's that thing, isn't it? The idea that everything should be in our ways, copybook form, but in most circumstances, it never was. Yeah, I'm... except to the Roman world, it was organisation and ordered. Uh, gateways, bathhouses, forums, basilicas, um, street alignments, brothels, everything. It was libraries, um, you know, this and that edicts read out in a forum, but it des didn't, des didn't necessarily mean to have to be in the center or, or around there. And the gateway doesn't that need, if you go to Killian and um, if you go to Kaya Wendt, it, um, the, the, the gateway from east to west is okay. But when you look at the gateway from north to south, it's not exactly in an alignment. No, it's not. I noticed that with a lot, lot of um, uh, the ports, the, the gateways are not actually equidistant on the north, and, south, east and west lines, yeah. And there's no reason, Bill, right, why the gateway in Kalita went couldn't have just been direct, but it wasn't. There's a practical reason for doing it. Mm. Practical reason for ah. doing it, exactly. Mm. Practical it's reason. It's all about building how they used to build. I mean, they made their own bricks, didn't they? Which exactly, they bricks. Which, which, which was not there before. It's, it's always that sort of process. Yeah. Um, 
Right, and and anything else you want to say before I go on to uh, Richard, and we'll we'll just sort of well, only uh, the, the Latin, yeah, the Latin was was used in the church from until about nineteen sixty three. Exactly, but then again, um, um, but can, we were taught it was Roger only speak academic. Latin? Can Bill speak Latin? Can Steve speak Latin? Can I speak Latin? None of us can. So, um, well, I can speak. I did see. I did do Latin, but Latin was taught in like grammar schools for, you know, uh, academia, really, because if you wanted to be a doctor or a lawyer, you'd have to have Latin, you know. And exactly. I don't know. So, exactly. Any, any, anything else you want to say, Anne? No, thank you. OK. And, and Richard, before we introduce the next class now, and we'll, what we'll do, we'll stop the recording in a moment. We'll, we'll start a new recording. So anything, Richard? No. You switched off. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, no, right. I'm okay. Right, so what, 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 what we're going to do, guys, we're going to... Um, uh, we, we've now got organize it. We've now got order in in, um, in this. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to um, I'm going to uh, Richard, you may as well hang on a little bit. And, um, you know, you, you're welcome to join us in this next session. It's fine. Um, so I don't think anybody's dream leaving us at this minute. No. I've got to finish at 730, Carl. So OK, well, we're, we're going to give this a blast. Don't, yeah, don't, don't sort of. Um, um, structure your talk to that, okay? I'll just say cheer you at seven thirty, okay? And you carry on, yeah. Okay, well, okay. that that's fine. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to end this lecture on the line now, and we're going to we're going to start a new lecture. Um, so we're going to um, uh, I've got to remember how to do this, right? Okay. Um, anyway, don't anyone don't forget to like and uh, subscribe or join on. YouTube, thanks for listening to the lecture on the line and lots more next week. Thank you very much. And obviously we'll be here next week at six 